everybody, it's Dr. Mandic, and welcome to the very, very end. It's the last, the last video. It's the last lecture, lecture 28, the very end of Introduction to Philosophy. You made it, almost, you're almost done. So what we're going to talk about is how philosophy can apply to you personally. We're going to be looking at personal philosophies and living philosophically philosophy and your personal life and you might say finally because that's all I care about is me so now I know what philosophy has to do with me thanks for making me wait let's start with a little joke so here is an illustration of the difference between living without philosophy and living philosophically you might say oh <laughs> that's not much of an improvement is it or you might say, oh, that's, that's cute. We're doomed anyway. It might be nice to do some fancy tricks on the way down. Let's talk about two interpretations of the phrase personal philosophy. When you hear personal philosophy, what do you interpret that as? Well, one way you can interpret it is we're asking about your personal views on the various philosophical topics. And if you haven't been thinking about this already, you should be. Many of the philosophical topics, if, if not all of them that we discussed, they're controversial. You could argue either side, and sometimes there's more than one side that you could give really strong arguments in favor of. What's the point? Well, one point is that you've got to have some kind of view. Which one is the one that you like? Which is the one that best fits with you? Do you think that free will exists or not? Do you think that you can have knowledge of the external world or it's just like a lucky guess? Do you think that it's okay to pull the lever on the trolley problem? So it's it, the philosopher Socrates said, you should know yourself. Know thyself was his one commandment. And one way of knowing thyself is to know what your personal views are on the various philosophical topics. So that's one interpretation of the phrase personal philosophy. Another interpretation of the phrase, the one that we're going to emphasize the most in this lecture, is that personal philosophy is just those philosophical theories that are specifically geared toward the topic of how to live one's life. So um, even though we're going to be mostly focused on number two, let me say a little bit more about number one, and that is that there's an extra credit assignment about number one. Spell out in your own words in a 500 word mini essay your personal philosophy addressing at least three of the following seven topics ethics, epistemology, metaphysics, God, free will, the mind, and death. This must be turned in through Blackboard as the assignment known as Extra Credit Essay Gamma. Okay, now let's focus on number two, philosophical theories that are specifically geared toward the topic of how to live one's life. Well, it turns out we haven't waited we're explicitly discussing it now in Lecture 28, but we've actually been talking about it for a long time, since before Lecture 28. There have been a lot of examples of philosophical theories that are specifically geared toward the topic of how to live one's life that we've been discussing throughout the semester. Way back in Lecture 7 was Aristotelianism. Aristotelianism is a philosophy that's specifically geared toward the topic of how to live one's life. More recently we got into Buddhism, so Lecture 26 was about Buddhism. That's a personal philosophy. The previous lecture, lecture 27, gave a bit of an introduction to existentialism, and then we're gonna we're gonna leave off with one more, an ancient philosophical approach known as Stoicism. As a warm up to get you warmed up for Stoicism, I want you to think about the relationship between the following three concepts. Sorry, four concepts. Number one, happiness. Number two, desire. Number three, the world. And number four, change. What is happiness? One way you might define happiness is when your desires and the world match, when they match up. So if you want a beer and then you have a beer, well, that's matching and now you're happy. If a bird lands on your shoulder and that's what you wanted to happen, then you're happy. 
Happiness is when your desires in the world match. Now, a lot of times your desires in the world don't match. You might want, you might want to buy a nice, a nice present for your best friend, but you don't have any money. So there's a mismatch between your desire and the world. You desire to have some money, and the world says, sorry, you don't have any money. So now you're unhappy. But aren't you going to act to change that? Philosophically, there's two ways you can act to change that. One thing you could do is to change the world. You could try to go get some money. And now you're changing the world to match your desire. But another way you could bring your desires in the world into correspondence is to change your desires. Now you might say, this sounds like sour grapes. Some of you might remember Aesop's Fables and you've heard the story of the fox who was trying to get some grapes that were hanging from a vine and the vine was a little bit too high and he couldn't reach them. And instead of going and getting a box and climbing up there so he could get the grapes that he, he wanted, he wanted those grapes, he said, you know what, they're probably sour, and he just walked away. Now, um, what the fox did, or at least tried to do, was to change his desires. He desired the grapes. His desire was frustrated. Instead of working harder to change the world and to make himself get the grapes, he changed his desire so he didn't want the grapes anymore. So what if we put this to work as a general personal philosophy? Then instead of trying to change the world, why don't you try to change yourself? You might wonder, well, what's the advantage of the one versus the other? And maybe the advantage of the one versus the other is that you have way more chances of succeeding if you focus on yourself. The world is pretty big. There's a lot going on there. Uh, you are much smaller. Maybe you're going to have better chances at happiness if you just try to change yourself instead of trying to change the world. Another argument for why it might be better to change yourself instead of the world is to say that the world has a bunch of other people in it. And if you try to change the world, maybe you're going to be messing with other people. And you have an, an ethical imperative to not mess with other people. So by trying to change the world, you're imposing your will on a world that is contained, uh, contains other people. And you might be stepping on their toes, which would be unethical. So that was a bit of a warm-up just to get you prepared for the general ideas of Stoicism. Uh, here are some sample Stoics. And by the way, there's going to be a Zeno, and I don't want you to confuse Zeno with Zeno. Way back when we were talking about space and whether you can travel from point A to point B, we were talking about a philosopher named Zeno. And that's Zeno of Alia, not to be confused with the Zeno of Citium, who is a key Stoic. And we've got Epictetus and Seneca and one of these philosophers was also a Roman emperor. Marcus Aurelius was an emperor, but also an important Stoic. There are some really good videos on uh, YouTube that introduce us to Stoicism. And we're going to take a look at those. So uh, we've got three, actually. They all do a pretty good job. Um, so first, we're going to look at something called The Philosophy of Stoicism by Massimo Piliucci. Uh, and here are the links to all the videos. Um, track those down. Um, next we'll look at something called How to Practice Stoicism, Three Stoic Exercises, and then finally Why Stoicism Matters. All right, let's start with The Philosophy of Stoicism by Massimo Piliucci. <laughs> You've been stranded thousands of miles from home with no money or possessions. Such a predicament would make many people despair and curse their awful fate. But for Zeno of Cyprus, it became the foundation of his life's work and legacy. The once wealthy merchant lost everything when he was shipwrecked in Athens around 300 BCE. With not much else to do, he wandered into a bookshop became intrigued by reading about Socrates, and proceeded to seek out and study with the city's noted philosophers. As Zeno began educating his own students, he originated the philosophy known as Stoicism, whose teachings of virtue, tolerance, and self-control 
have inspired generations of thinkers and leaders. The name Stoicism comes from the Stoa Poikile, the decorated public colonnade where Zeno and his disciples gathered for discussion. Today, we colloquially use the word stoic to mean someone who remains calm under pressure and avoids emotional extremes. But while this captures important aspects of stoicism, the original philosophy was more than just an attitude. The Stoics believed that everything around us operates according to a web of cause and effect, resulting in a rational structure of the universe, which they called logos. And while we may not always have control over the events affecting us, we can have control over how we approach things. Rather than imagining an ideal society, the Stoic tries to deal with the world as it is, while pursuing self-improvement through four cardinal virtues. Practical wisdom, the ability to navigate complex situations in a logical, informed, and calm manner. Temperance, the exercise of self-restraint and moderation in all aspects of life. Justice, treating others with fairness even when they have done wrong. And courage, not just in extraordinary circumstances, but facing daily challenges with clarity and integrity. As Seneca, one of the most famous Roman Stoics, wrote, sometimes even to live is an act of courage. But while Stoicism focuses on personal improvement, it's not a self-centered philosophy. At a time when Roman laws considered slaves as property, Seneca called for their humane treatment and stressed that we all share the same fundamental humanity. Nor does Stoicism encourage passivity. The idea is that only people who have cultivated virtue and self-control in themselves can bring positive change in others. One of the most famous Stoic writers was also one of Rome's greatest emperors. Over the course of his 19-year reign, Stoicism gave Marcus Aurelius the resolve to lead the empire through two major wars while dealing with the loss of many of his children. Centuries later, Marcus's journals would guide and comfort Nelson Mandela through his 27-year imprisonment during his struggle for racial equality in South Africa. After his release and eventual victory, Mandela stressed peace and reconciliation, believing that while the injustices of the past couldn't be changed, his people could confront them in the present and seek to build a better, more just future. Stoicism was an active school of philosophy for several centuries in Greece and Rome. As a formal institution, it faded away, but its influence has continued to this day. Christian theologians such as Thomas Aquinas have admired and adopted its focus on the virtues, and there are parallels between Stoic ataraxia, or tranquility of mind, and the Buddhist concept of nirvana. One particularly influential Stoic was the philosopher Epictetus, who wrote that suffering stems not from the events in our lives, but from our judgments about them. This has resonated strongly with modern psychology and the self-help movement. For example, rational emotive behavioral therapy focuses on changing the self-defeating attitudes people form about their life circumstances. There's also Viktor Frankl's logotherapy. Informed by Frankl's own time as a concentration camp prisoner, logotherapy is based on the stoic principle that we can harness our willpower to fill our lives with meaning, even in the bleakest situations. Okay, let's take a look now at the second video. This one is How to Practice Stoicism, Three Stoic Exercises. 
Stoicism is an ancient Roman philosophy that is regaining immense popularity due to its practicality. In this video, we are going to discuss three stoic exercises that you can use to quote, live the good life. Now with me is Isaac from The Realized Man. Marcus Aurelius advises us to perform an exercise frequently called a view from above. This exercise involves us envisioning ourselves from the third person. In this vision, we zoom out while keeping ourselves right in the center. We continue zooming out and contemplating the scale of the universe. For instance, your first zoom might only encompass a view of you from above the roof of your house. Increase magnitude and you might see the street in which you live at. Increase magnitude again, you might view your own country and all its inhabitants. Keep going until you can get a picture of Earth from the stars. By considering this scale, we can gain a better perspective on the insignificance of our problems. When compared to the universe, whatever problems we have will appear to be incredibly trivial. For instance, if you are feeling down because a girl flaked on you or someone cheated on you or perhaps you lost your job. Try this exercise. It is far easier to overcome the emotional hurdles we experience when we put things into the right perspective. Negative visualization, despite the name, is an exercise that will increase your default level of happiness, so to say, if it's practiced consistently. The exercise consists of you envisioning what it would feel like if you lost certain things in your life. Some of the things that you might consider losing are how would it feel to not have a roof over your head? How would it feel to lose social status? How would it feel to live in a third world country? Some of you might actually be living in a third world country. How would it feel to have a major physical disability and how would it feel to lose a loved one? This exercise is not meant to be dark or morbid. It's meant to put things into perspective of how you're living right now, allowing you to see how lucky you truly are. For some people, it changes the things they take for granted and puts those things into the thankfulness category. I used to take this for granted and now I'm thankful for it. Some people go as far as to actually practicing the loss of something. For example, maybe not drinking clean bottled water for a day or going on a week hiatus from family. It also prepares you for the worst case scenarios in which one of these things actually does happen. Now you're not meant to fixate on these thoughts, but consider them from time to time. This is a very practical way for you to practice gratitude. Naturally, when you consider things from being removed from your life, you start to gain a sense of gratitude. Now, gratitude is important because of a thing called hedonic adaptation. Basically, it's a term that defines the tendency for humans to always go back to their default level of happiness. For example, if you won the lottery and became a millionaire, your base level of happiness will increase for a little bit. However, when you become accustomed to the lifestyle, despite all the new toys, you will return to your base level of happiness. It'll just be higher. Gratitude breaks that pattern, allowing you to enjoy each step on the ladder. Hopefully, this will help you be grateful when you own a 2004 Ford Taurus like me, and you can also be grateful when you own a Lamborghini Aventador. Method 3 voluntary discomfort. The last exercise has been advised to us by Epictetus. It is called voluntary discomfort. In this exercise, we're going to be deliberately putting ourselves through uncomfortable situations. We will do this in order to train ourselves to not hold onto comfort with such high regard. We can perform this voluntary discomfort in a number of ways. Some suggestions are cold showers, exercising in the morning, walking in the cold without a jumper, fasting for a day, sleeping on the floor. All these things will change your relationship with comfort. Once you overcome the need for comfort, life will become much easier. Setting your goals and sticking to them will be far easier. When most people complain about being uncomfortable, you won't be able to relate. You're literally training yourself up to be like a Navy SEAL. This method will harden you up for life so that when you have to face adversity, it won't be anywhere near as bad. Eventually things will go astray at some stage in your life. You want to have the mental and physical fortitude to weather that storm, whatever it may be. So those are the three stoic exercises. Stoicism is a practical philosophy that has survived the test of time due to its universal applications. If you practice these stoic meditations, you will be well on your way to the good life. One more video, one more video to watch why Stoicism matters. Stoicism is a philosophical school that began in ancient Greece and was later dominant in ancient Rome and which continues to have hugely urgent and important things to teach us about calm, resilience and emotional stability. Its ideas should be at the heart of any attempt to remain serene in the face of a turbulent, unpredictable and often mean-minded world. Arguably, the greatest and certainly the most prolific Stoic philosopher was the Roman author and statesman Seneca, who was born in 4 BC in Spain and died in 65 AD in Rome. A lot of Seneca's thought is known to us from the letters he wrote to his friends, giving them counsel at times of trouble. 
Seneca had a friend called Lucilius, a civil servant working in Sicily. One day, Lucilius learnt of a lawsuit against him, which threatened to end his career and disgrace his good name. He wrote to Seneca in a panic. You may expect that I'm going to advise you to picture a happy outcome and to rest in the allurements of hope, replied the philosopher. But I'm going to conduct you to peace of mind through another route, which culminated in the advice, if you wish to put off all worry, assume that what you fear may happen is certainly going to happen. This is an essential Stoic idea. We must always try to picture the worst that could happen and then remind ourselves that the worst is survivable. The goal is not to imagine that bad things don't unfold, it's to see that we are far more capable of enduring them than we currently think. To calm Lucilius down, Seneca advised him to make himself entirely at home with the idea of humiliation, poverty and ongoing unemployment, but to learn to see that these were, from the right perspective, not the end of everything. If you lose this case, can anything more severe happen to you than being sent into exile or led to prison, asked the philosopher, who had himself survived bankruptcy and eight years of exile in Corsica. Hope for that which is utterly just, and prepare yourself for that which is utterly unjust. Seneca gave Lucilius a meditation to mull over in the luxury of his home that he was now in danger of losing. I may become a poor man. I shall then be one among many. I may be exiled. I shall then regard myself as born in the place to which I shall be sent. They may put me in chains. What then? Am I free from bonds now? Behold this clogging burden of a body to which nature has fettered me. Seneca tells us that we must grow familiar with and hold before us at all times not just the sort of events we like to plan for that are recorded in living memory or are common in our age group and class, but the entire range of possibilities, a longer and inevitably far less agreeable list which finds space for cataclysmic fires, sackings and untimely deaths. He wrote, Nothing ought to be unexpected by us. Let us place before our eyes in its entirety the nature of man's lot, not the kind of evil that often happens, but the very greatest evil that can possibly happen. We must reflect upon fortune fully and completely. At one point, a friend of Seneca's lost a son, and the consoling thoughts ran in a similar direction. Marcia, a lady of a senatorial family, was devastated by the death of her son Matilius, not yet twenty-five. She fell into a period of mourning that seemed to have no end. Three years after the death, her sorrow had not abated one bit. Indeed, it was growing stronger every day. So Seneca sent her an essay in which he expressed the hope that given the length of time that had elapsed since Matilius' death, she would forgive him for going beyond the usual condolences to deliver something darker but perhaps more effective. To lose a son was surely the greatest grief that could befall a mother, but given the vulnerability of the human frame, Matilius's early death had its place in a merciless natural order which daily offered examples of its handiwork. He wrote, we never anticipate evils before they actually arrive. So many funerals pass our doors, yet we never dwell on death. So many deaths are untimely, yet we make plans for our own infants, how they will don the toga, serve in the army, and succeed to their father's property. They might end up doing such things, but how mad to love them, without remembering that no one had offered us a guarantee they would grow to maturity, let alone make it to dinner time. If Matilius's death had been unexpected for Marcia, it was only on the basis of a wishful assessment of probabilities. You say, I didn't think it would happen. Do you think there is anything that will not happen when you know that it is possible to happen, when you see that it has already happened to many? Seneca imagined meeting Marcia before her birth and inviting her on a tour of the troubled earth so she could weigh up the terms of life, then choose whether or not to accept them. On the one hand, Marcia would see a planet of awe-inspiring beauty and occasional goodness. On the other, a place of intermittent, unspeakable horror. Would Marcia choose to step into such a world? Her existence suggested her answer. Importantly, the Stoics and Seneca did add that if things were truly unendurable, we had no obligation to continue forever. Here is another letter from Seneca. The wise man will live as long as he ought, not as long as he can. 
He always reflects concerning the quality and not the quantity of his life. As soon as there are numerous events in his life that give him trouble and disturb his peace of mind, he sets himself free. And this privilege is his, not only when the crisis is upon him, but as soon as fortune seems to be maltreating him. Then he looks about carefully and sees whether he ought or ought not to end his life on that account. He holds that it makes no difference to him whether his taking off be natural or self-inflicted. He does not regard it with fear, as if it were a great loss, for no man can lose very much when but a driblet remains. It's not a question of dying earlier or later, but of dying well or ill. And dying well means escape from the danger of living ill. Seneca was not advocating random or thoughtless exits. He was attempting to give us more courage in the face of anxiety by reminding us that it is always within our remit when we have genuinely tried everything and rationally had enough to choose a noble path out of our troubles. When we are furious, paranoid, depleted or sad, the philosophy of Stoicism is on hand, as it has been for 2,000 years, to nurse us with its hugely fortifying, distinctive and unusual wisdom and friendship. Study questions. Study question one. Which personal philosophy is this best regarded as a definition of? Worry not about what is outside of your control, but only what is inside of it. Is this A, Buddhism? Wait, sorry. Is this A, Aristotelianism, B, Buddhism, C, Kantianism, D, Stoicism, or E, Existentialism? Study question two. Which personal philosophy is best regarded as a... Sorry, which personal philosophy is this best regarded as a definition of? The best one can do is to free oneself from suffering, and this can only be achieved by freeing oneself from desire. Is this A, Aristotelianism, B, Buddhism, C, Kantianism, D, Stoicism, or E, Existentialism? And finally, study question three. This Stoic exercise is designed to take advantage of a psychological phenomenon known as hedonic adaptation. Is this A, the view from above, B, negative visualization, C, voluntary discomfort, D, meditate on loving kindness, or E, will your action to be a law of nature? The answers to those study questions are D, B, B, and this brings us to the end. I hope that you learned something worth learning in at least one of these 28 video lectures. I thought it was interesting making these videos, and I hope you found at least some of it somewhat interesting. And if not, well, you don't have to do that again. Talk to you later.